Okay, so when we talk about databases, whether they're hospital records, healthcare systems, or clinical, they have to have certain characteristics. So first of all, they have to be representative. So whether you're already using an existing database or whether you're trying to create a new database, you have to keep in mind that the sample size or the sample that you're picking from the database has to be representative of the population of concern. They also have to be timely in the sense that this has to be ongoing and you can get data as and when the patient encounters the healthcare system. There has to be continuity, so every single data point or every single patient point has to be measured and has to be entered into the system. Every patient must have a unique identifier number that would link the patient across the system to all records. And last but not least, it must be accessible, so there should not be delays within being able to access it and analyze it for particular use or a particular question. Some of the contents that we would want in the database would be like I mentioned before, all prescription, non-prescription drugs, all of the patient information that you can possibly get from the patient. If they're coming in for multiple visits, then you want the physical statistics, all the diagnostics, tests, lab screenings, everything coming in from that visit to be as part of this database. Any other socioeconomic characteristics, demographic characteristics, again, they should form a part of the database in order to do the complete analysis. Any particular quality of life or humanistic outcomes if they're studied should form should be included in the database. So some of the special applications of pharmacoepidemiology include drug utilization studies. Like I said before, it could be prospective, it could be retrospective in nature, and it can give you utilization patterns. So over a period of time, does the population utilize, how much of the drug does the population utilize? Do they fill it? Do they not fill it? What's going on with that population? So it gives you a much better understanding. You can also use it for evaluating and improving physician prescribing. So let's say you're trying to change certain physician prescribing behaviors in a hospital. For example, when we are looking at antimicrobial resistance in today's world, we're trying to change physician prescribing behaviors with regards to antibiotics. So we can use pharmacoepidemiology to understand what physicians prescribing behaviors are. And once we have a baseline understanding, we can then try to implement interventions that will help reduce or change or modify those behaviors in some way and then measure what happens later on. We could do vaccine studies. So any special methodological issues that may arise in terms of vaccine studies, because vaccines and biologicals are a complicated area for it. So any of those things can be done using pharmacopidemiology fairly easily. Studies of birth defects, so any drug-induced birth defects, particularly, for example, thalidomide back in the 1970s, which caused um, severe birth defects. So you can use those kinds of studies to, or you can use pharmacopidemiology to assess and understand that. You could also use it for risk management, so to understand what the risks in the population are and then how to eventually manage those risks. So where, what are people supposed to do? What are the side effects to watch out for? You could also use to study medication errors in a hospital. So let's say you're in a hospital or even a clinical setting and you want to see if there's errors in dispensing, if there's errors in filling the medication, then pharmacopidemiology can be very useful because it's an observational science. A lot of it would involve trying to find out the association between your observations and potential errors or harms that could be caused from it. So in general, data from randomized clinical trials do not generally reflect world outcomes or in real time outcomes. They reflect more of what happens in a very strict lab setting. They're very essential and very useful for regulatory purposes because you do have to do a clinical trial with a placebo in order to make it through most um, regulatory systems in the world. But at the same time, the real-life application is much more diminished.